Very good evening to all of our friends and welcome to the Hindu News Analysis of Shankar IAS Academy for the date 20th January 2021. The list of the relevant news articles taken for today's discussion from five different editions of the Hindu newspaper along with their page numbers are given here for your reference. Also the handwritten notes in the PDF format and timestampings for all the news articles taken for today's discussion is given in the description box and also in the comment section for the best interest of the viewers. Let us now begin with our first news article. Now this discussion is based on this editorial. As you are aware, in the next 3-4 days, the government will be releasing the economic survey of 2020-21 and will present the union budget for the next financial year. The economic survey will inform us about the state of the Indian economy based on the available empirical evidence. And the budget will be providing a detailed account of the government's finances, its revenues and expenditures. And before these documents are released, the authors try to provide us with a glimpse of the economic situation of India. So in this discussion, let us see what the authors say and also the suggestions for economic recovery. First, the authors provide us with the government's estimates that are crucial to know the economic condition of India. See, on many occasions, we have discussed these estimates. And now let us have a recap. See, the government released the first advance estimates of national income this month, that is January, according to which the growth in real GDP during 2020-21 is estimated at a contraction of 7.7%. And before this, in November 2020, the National Statistical Office or NSO published the GDP estimates for the second quarter. It suggested an economic recovery in India because there was a decrease in the rate of contraction of GDP. See the rate of contraction reduced to 7.5% in quarter 2 from 23.9% in quarter 1. And even the recent monetary policy statement of RBA projected a positive growth in the remaining quarters of the financial year, that is in quarter 3 and quarter 4 of financial year 2020-21. And this was the situation after the pandemic, but even before that, India's growth rate fell to 3.1% in quarter 4 of 2019-20. So now let us see the measures taken by the Reserve Bank of India to spur the growth. First, the RBA decided to continue the accommodative monetary policy to support growth. Here, accommodative monetary policy is also known as loose credit or easy monetary policy. It occurs when a central bank attempts to expand the overall money supply in order to boost the economy when growth is slowing. So because of this stance, the RBA retained the existing policy rate of repo at 4% that is, it was decided to leave the repo rate unchanged at 4% for making the cost of borrowing cheaper. See, when the money is easily accessible through banks, the money supply in the economy increases. And this leads to increased spending. When businesses can easily borrow money, they will be having more funds to expand operations and hire more workers, which means the unemployment rate will decrease. On the other hand, people and businesses tend to save less when the economy is stimulated, which is due to the low saving interest rates which are offered by the banks. Now the situation is that if money supply is loosened for a long time, there will be too much money chasing too few goods and services which leads to inflation. And this leads to increased costs of some goods. But if you see, based on the All India Consumer Price Index data which was released by NSO for the month of December 2020, the consumer price index inflation reduced to 4.6%. But the scenario was worse in September and October 2020 as CPA inflation rose sharply to 7.3% in September and further to 7.6% in October. So they were above the tolerance range of the inflation targeting by RBA. As you know, the central government has notified 4% CPI inflation as the target for the period from August 5, 2016 to March 31, 2021. And this target has a tolerance range of plus or minus 2, that is, the upper tolerance limit is 6% and the lower tolerance limit is 2%. But now the CPI inflation has reduced, but in spite of that, the low real interest rates are continuing. And if you notice here, the target fixed is for until March 31, 2021. So it will be reviewed in this March, where the authors suggest to revise this inflation targeting framework. The second important measure of RBA was continuing the liquidity infusion programs, which includes on-tap targeted long-term repo operations or TLTRO. See, we have discussed the long-term repo operations or LTRO in many of our Hindu analysis and it is a tool under which the banks can get low-cost credits or funds from the RBA for a tenure of 1 year to 3 years. And the rate of interest for this will be the prevailing repo rate and not higher than this. And to receive such funds, the banks will provide government securities with matching tenure or a higher tenure as the collateral to RBA. And see, the benefit of this tool is that banks will be able to receive liquidity for money needs of 1-3 to three years at the policy repo rate. Now, in targeted long-term repo operations or TLTRO, the operations are similar to LTRO but there is one major difference. That is, under targeted LTRO, banks will have to invest the amount borrowed in fresh acquisitions of specified securities from primary or secondary market. 
Here the RBI will specify that a certain portion of funds borrowed shall be deployed in securities issued by specific targeted players. For example, it may say that the banks have to deploy 50% of the funds borrowed in security issued by microfinance institutions and NBFCs. Here the RBI may also give a timeline for the deployment in specified securities. But if the banks fail to deploy the funds in specific securities within the stipulated time frame, then the interest rate on undeployed funds will increase to 200 basic points above the prevailing policy repo rate. And this kind of penal interest is applicable for the number of days such funds remain undeployed. Here the objective is that the specified portion of borrowed funds shall reach the targeted players and securities. So this is the background. Now in October, the RBI started the on-tap PLTRO of up to 3 years tenure for a total amount of up to 1 lakh crore rupees at a floating rate which is linked to the policy repo rate. Here on-tap means readily available or on-hand. See the liquidity availed by the banks under this scheme has to be deployed in corporate bonds, commercial papers and non-convertible debentures which are issued by entities in these specific sectors. Here the list of the eligible sectors for deployment of funds which are availed under on-tap TLTRO include agriculture, agri-infrastructure, secured retail, MSMEs and drugs, pharmaceuticals and healthcare. And later in December, this scheme was expanded in order to cover other stressed sectors in line with the credit guarantee which is available under the Emergency Credit Line Guarantee Scheme 2.0 of the government of India. And this was done to encourage banks to extend credit support to the stressed sectors at a lower cost. And the other measures that were continued by RBA were the operation twist with open market operation. And we will discuss these measures in some other day. So these are very important measures for easing financial conditions further and to provide support to key sectors of the economy. So here the point to be noted is that the signs of the recovery projected which we had discussed in the beginning are dependent on sustained policy support. So the authors predict that the Union Budget 2020-21 will sustain the policy support and will also provide the necessary fiscal stimulus. See the authors are advocating this based on the example that after the global financial crisis, the economies which resorted to significant fiscal stimulus were able to rebound faster. And in India, fiscal stimulus is needed to get the targeted state interventions in social sectors like public health and education and also in sectors like agriculture and physical infrastructure. Now, according to the IMS fiscal monitor, there is a need to scale up the public investment in order to ensure successful reopening and to boost growth and also to prepare economies for the future. And this public investment in turn will also enhance the private corporate investments which has been dropping so far. See, the authors are stating this based on a research paper which showed that the public infrastructure investment is the prime determinant of private corporate investment in India. And this statement is against the common fear of financial crowding out. See here crowding out effect is an economic theory arguing that rising public sector expenditure drives down or even eliminates private sector spending. So based on this theory, the government often fears to boost its fiscal stimulus. But according to the authors, the final crowding out is misplaced or inept in the context of India. So as a conclusion, the authors again stress for not withdrawing the ongoing economic policy support abruptly, otherwise it will harm the recovery of the economy of India and its growth. So this is all about this editorial. With this information, let us move on to the next news. Now this editorial is based on the draft of the 5th Science, Technology and Innovation Policy or simply the Draft Science Policy. See recently the government issued this draft science technology and innovation policy and the idea behind this science policy in India has always been to encourage individual initiative for the acquisition and dissemination of knowledge. So keeping this in mind, the Indian government has always drafted the science policies so far. So let us discuss the draft of this fifth science policy and also the opinion of the author. The syllabus relevant for this analysis is highlighted here for your reference. Please go through it. See the draft policy is out in the public domain and the public is expected to provide the feedback before it becomes a policy. But as per the authors, the problem with this draft is that it is full of confusing jargons that it makes very difficult to comprehend what is given in the draft. So leaving this aside, let us look at some of the provisions of this policy. Firstly, the policy aims to make India one among the three top scientific superpowers. However, the draft policy says that for this to happen, we need to attract our best minds and also avoid brain drain and moreover develop a people-centric science, technology and innovation ecosystem. It also suggests another thing for this to happen that is the private sector's contribution to the gross domestic expenditure on research and development should be doubled every five years. However, the problem here is even the 2013 draft had similar provisions. But the draft policy is silent on what was achieved on this front. And the author here says that putting the burden on private players to invest in research and development is a wrong strategy. 
In fact, no Western countries, even the US, did not depend on private sector for research and development investment. See, research and development is a long-term investment and private companies cannot be expected to take on this task. And it is only the government who can do this. Saying this, the author points out that the research and development investment in science is between 0.5% and 0.6% of GDP. A lot of experts and policymakers have argued that the government should raise the research and development investment to 2% of the GDP. And the authors point out that without doing this, the government is trying to put the burden on the private sector. And on funding mechanisms, the draft mentions that a robust, cohesive financial landscape remains at the core of creating a science, technology, innovation driven Atmanirbhar Bharat. And see, the center wants to create this financial landscape from states, private enterprises, and foreign multinational companies. The author says that this funding mechanism is shifting the burden from the center to others and cannot achieve the desired results because we cannot expect the private sector to invest in research and development that too during a pandemic. And the author opens that before suggesting financial models, the policymakers should go back and think about the self-financing revenue model which was proposed in the Daradon declaration for CSIR labs back in 2015. The author says that the policymakers should critically evaluate this first and then formulate the new models. The draft policy tries to balance the top-down and bottom-up approaches and it wants to focus on the administrative and financial management, then research governance, data and regulatory frameworks and also system interconnectedness. And the government feels that achieving all this will lead to a robust STI governance. However, the author says that in spite of all these words, the other provisions of draft talks about creating several new authorities, observatories and centers. And this will only increase the role of bureaucracy in science administration. So what is the need of the artist not creating new authorities but to provide more autonomy to research and academic centers. And in spite of all these shortcomings, there are few areas in the draft policy that are well intentioned. They are the alternative mechanisms of governance of the financial landscape, the administrative burden of researchers, problem with journal paywalls and also promise to explore the international best practices of grant management. Now, apart from all these, the draft policy is silent on numerous issues. See, in the year 2019, more than 2,400 students dropped out from the 23 IITs in just two years. And worse of all, half of them belong to the SEST and other backward classes category. One more worrying trend is the suicides that are on a rise in IITs. And all these could be due to caste discrimination. And here we should know that the draft policy talks about creating an inclusive culture in academia and even promises to tackle discrimination based on gender, caste, religion, geography, language, disability and other exclusions and inequalities. It even mentioned about more representation to women and LGBTQ community. But the draft doesn't talk about how to achieve all this or the ways to achieve this. One more thing the author talks about is how the hyper-nationalism which is present in today's scenario is affecting the progress of science in the country. And the author concludes saying that the ruling dispensation has a moral obligation to facilitate an environment that encourages a mindset that constantly challenges conventional wisdom as well as open-minded inquiry among the students. Only a mind that is dissenting can do this. So here the author talks about tolerance of dissent as he is a bit apprehensive about the hyper-nationalism trend that is going on in our country right now. So with the advent of the new disruptive technologies, global competitiveness will be increasingly determined by the quality of science and technology. So in this regard, our country has no time to waste and the government should create the relevant environment for the promotion of science. So this is all about this editorial. With this, let us move on to the next news. See, here we have this article from the editorial page which talks about the upcoming annual budget in specific about the budget speech. Now let's see what the author is trying to say here. The syllabus relevant for this analysis is highlighted here for your reference. Please go through it. See, the author takes a very critical stand of the current government and its policies. Firstly, the author predicts what will be in the budget speech of Ms. Sita Raman. Now, going by the experience, it can be expected that the speech will be full of self-congratulatory declarations of how the country, the economy and the government's finances have withstood the pandemic and how the economy is set on a path of revival. It will also claim that the government's policies have enabled the country to deal with the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic. And further, it may downplay the completely inadequate health spending even in the face of the pandemic and use absolute numbers rather than rates of change to suggest that the public spending has been directed towards those in need. And here the author says only some of the claims of the finance minister will be correct as the stimulus announced during the lockdown was largely formal sector centric. It is certainly true that the COVID-19 infections are on the decline in India and similar trend is observed in the Asian region generally, including in countries that did not implement the extreme lockdown that India experienced. 
and the author notes that the revival of the economy from the complete collapse of the first quarter of the current fiscal year is largely confined to the formal sector. And this is because informal activities are still facing crisis. Now talking about the employment, the author writes that the recovery of employment is because of the absence of social security for the bulk of Indian workers. See here the absence of the social security forced the workers to seek out any income generating opportunities simply to survive. Wage incomes are significantly lower than before the lockdown. And the stock market reaching new highs is more of an indication of how divorced it has become from the real economy and its prospects. See, we have discussed the correlation between stock markets and real economy on 18th of this month, explaining that though productivity has been decreased in the country, the Sensex was booming, reflecting the decoupling of stocks and production activity. Also, the past year has witnessed significant destruction of livelihoods and also increases in material distress, poverty and hunger. The author highlights that talking of economic recovery without explaining the above issues is unjustifiable. Next, the author talks about the numbers, that is the budget projections. See from the past budgets, the numbers for revenues and expenditures have been inaccurate. And this is because the budget numbers are excessively optimistic projections for revenue generation in the remainder of the current year. And it is also about reducing the actual expenditures of the central government by pushing items off budget. See here what is the meaning of this off budget. See off budget borrowings are loans that are taken not by the government directly but by any other public institution which borrows on the directions of the central government. So this is a way for the center to finance its expenditures while keeping the debt under limit so that it is not counted in the calculation of the fiscal deficit. As the liability of the loan is not directly on the center, the loan is not included in the national fiscal deficit. And this helps keep the country's fiscal deficit within acceptable limits. And this concern has been repeatedly brought up by the Comptroller and Auditor General of India, that is CAG. A CAG report in 2018 identified at least three methods of reducing the stated expenditure. First one is not paying for the full fertilizer subsidy by using special banking arrangements. And the second one, not paying the central government's dues to the Food Corporation of India for the food subsidy and forcing the Food Corporation of India to borrow from the market. And the third, using other special purpose vehicles to pay for the infrastructure investment like the long-term irrigation fund. In 2017-18, just those three items amounted to around 130,000 crore rupees or 1.8 percentage of the GDP. And see, other strategies also include not paying states the rightful dues under the GST compensation fund or not paying what the state governments have already spent on the schemes like Narega. So these strategies are problematic not only because they are non-transparent, it's because they also force other agencies like the state governments and the public sector enterprises to go in for expensive loans that are unnecessarily adding to their future interest costs. And here the author feels that the numbers presented in the budget are not to be taken seriously either for the current year projections or for the next year's estimates. So what data should be trusted then? The data from the Controller General of Accounts. It provides the most reliable information. According to CAG data, between April and November 2020, the revenues of the central government predictably collapsed by around 18%. Despite that, expenditures should have increased because during lockdowns, only public spending can keep the economy thriving. And even this is what the government promised, that is in three rounds of stimulus packages, the government claimed to inject 1.7 lakh crore in March, then 20 lakh crore in May, and then 2.65 lakh crore rupees in November. But it turns out that very little of these large amounts involved actual commitments of more public spending. And the public accounts show that the total spending of the central government increased only by 86,301 crore rupees. And this was only a 4.6% increase. This is not even enough to keep pace with inflation. In other words, the central government reduced its real spending over the period of the pandemic and economic crisis. And this contractionary fiscal stance added to the material suffering of the people and deprived them of basic goods and essential public services at a time of much greater need. And the author concludes that only if the finance minister realizes this and changes the course moving to a more expansionary fiscal stance, prioritizing employment generation and also the public service provision, the budget speech of this year will be worth listening to. So let us wait and see how the budget speech is going to be this year. With this information, let us move on to the next news. Now have a look at this question. It is based on this news article which is with reference to the Protection of Children from Sexual Offences Act of 2012 or simply POCSO Act. The news is that the Supreme Court has stayed a controversial Bombay High Court verdict which acquitted a man found guilty of assault under the POCSO Act on the grounds that he groped his victim over her clothes and there was no skin-to-skin -skin contact between them. 
On January 19, the Bombay High Court's Nagpur bench created a public resentment after it acquitted a man under the POXO Act, saying that an act against a minor would amount to groping or sexual assault only if there is a skin-to-skin -skin contact. The court concluded that mere touching or pressing of a clothed body of a child did not amount to sexual assault. Now the good news is that the Supreme Court has stayed this controversial order. Now what is POXO Act? See, to deal with the child sexual abuse cases, the Government of India has brought in the Protection of Children from Sexual Offences Act of 2012. Know that it is a comprehensive law to provide for the protection of children from the offences like sexual assault, sexual harassment and pornography. And very importantly, it safeguards the interests of the child at very stage of the judicial process by incorporating child-friendly mechanisms for reporting, recording of evidence, investigation and also speedy trial of offences through designated special courts. The Act defines a child as any person below 18 years of age. It also defines different forms of sexual abuse including penetrative and non-penetrative assault as well as sexual harassment and pornography. It deems a sexual assault to be aggravated under certain circumstances like when the abused child is mentally ill or when the abuse is committed by a person in a position of trust or authority like a family member, police officer, teacher or doctor. And people who traffic children for sexual purposes are also punishable under the provisions of this Act. In keeping with the best international child protection standards, the Act also provides for mandatory reporting of sexual offences. And this casts a legal duty upon a person who has knowledge that a child has been sexually abused to report the offence. And if he fails to do so, he may be punished with 6 months of imprisonment and or with a fine. And know that this is a gender neutral Act, meaning it investigates the sexual assault on both minor boys and girls. And this Act was recently amended in 2019. And the 2019 Amendment Act has extended the definition of aggravated sexual assault by adding two offences. One is assault committed during a natural calamity and the second one is administering or help in administering any hormone or any chemical substance to a child for the purpose of attaining early sexual maturity. The amendment also increased the punishments for various offences. So this is in brief about the POXO Act. Now with this information have a look at this question. Consider the following statements with reference to Protection of Children from Sexual Offences Act. It is a three statements based question. The first statement reads, it casts a legal duty upon a person who has knowledge that a child has been sexually abused to report the offence. Yes, this statement is correct. And the second statement reads, the act mandates more severe punishments if the offence is committed by a police or a doctor. Yes, this statement is also correct. Now the third statement reads, it is not applicable to the sexual offences committed against a boy child. See, this statement is wrong as we have seen that the POXO Act is gender neutral, meaning it investigates the sexual assault of both minor boys and girls. Here minor boys and girls means persons who have not achieved the age of 18 years. So the question asks for the correct statement or statements. Here statement 1 and 2 are correct and statement 3 is wrong. So the correct answer for this question is option B 1 and 2 only. Now have a look at this second question. It is framed based on this news article which talks about the World Health Organization. As you know, the World Health Organization is a specialized agency of United Nations that deals with matters related to international health. It was founded in 7th April 1948 with 194 member countries and it is the first global health organization. Its objectives include promoting of health and socio-economic activities, improving health security, strengthening health services, then generating health information, then collaborating and encouraging partnerships, and finally, reforming and improving the performances of its associated branches and centers. Now, the governance of World Health Organization takes place through the World Health Assembly, which is the supreme decision-making body, and the executive board, which gives effect to the decisions and policies of the Health Assembly. And know that the organization is headed by the Director General, who is appointed by the Health Assembly on the nomination of the executive board. Now, talking about the World Health Assembly, we saw that it is the decision-making body of the WHO and it is attended by delegations from all WHO member countries. It focuses on a specific health agenda which is prepared by the executive board. The main functions of the World Health Assembly are to determine the policies of the organization, then appoint the director general, supervise financial policies and review and approve the proposed program budget. And know that the Health Assembly is held annually in Geneva, Switzerland. Now coming to the executive board, it is composed of 34 technically qualified members who are elected for 3 years term. The annual board meeting is held in January when the members agree upon the agenda of the World Health Assembly and also the resolutions to be considered by the Health Assembly. A second shorter meeting takes place in May as a follow-up to the Health Assembly. The main functions of the board are to implement the decisions and policies of the Health Assembly and advise and facilitate its work. Note that the 140th session of the Executive Board had taken place on 18th to 26th January 2021. Now with this information, have a look at this question. Consider the following statements with respect to World Health Organization. 
The first statement reads, any country can become a member of the WHO by accepting its constitution. Now this statement is incorrect. See all the countries which are members of the United Nations may become the members of WHO by accepting its constitution. Other countries may be admitted as members when their application has been approved by a simple majority vote of the World Health Assembly. And territories which are not responsible for the conduct of their international relations may be admitted as associate members. And this can be done based on an application made on their behalf by the member or other authority responsible for their international relations. And note that the members of WHO are grouped according to regional distribution. And India comes under the Southeast Asia region. Now the second statement reads, The Director General of the World Health Organization is appointed by the Health Assembly on the nomination of the Executive Board. Yes, this statement is correct. So in this question, we have to identify the incorrect statement or statements. Here we know that statement 1 is incorrect and statement 2 is correct. So the correct answer for this question is option A, one only. Now have a look at this third question. It is based on improvised explosive device or IED. See the question is based on this news article which talks about the destruction caused by an IED explosion in Jammu and Kashmir. See the IED or the improvised explosive device is a homemade bomb that is frequently employed by guerrillas, insurgents, and other non-state actors as an effective weapon against a conventional military force. IED is capable of causing death, physical injuries and also it can damage critical infrastructure and create spread of fear and disruption across the affected communities. In principle, all IEDs consist of an initiating mechanism, a detonator, an explosive charge and a casing or collection of projectiles that produces lethal fragments upon detonation. In practice, IEDs can be made of many different kinds of objects and materials including artillery or mortar rounds, aerial bombs, certain types of fertilizers, TNT and other explosives. They can also contain radiological, chemical or biological components to increase their lethal and psychological effects. See, insurgents have used a wide variety of initiating systems to trigger detonations and such systems fall into two basic categories that are command initiated and autonomously initiated. See, command initiated IEDs are detonated through human interaction with a triggering mechanism. For example, we have cell phones, pagers, cordless telephones, automatic garage door openers, car alarms, wireless doorbells and remote controlled toys. The autonomously initiated IEDs are detonated automatically without any human intervention. Now the common examples for those initiators are trip wires, pressure plates, infrared system and magnetic detonators. Now talking about combating IEDs, since IED production takes place outside the government control, the traditional arms regulation approach like regulating governmental production, trade and the use of weapon through a multilateral agreement may not yield effective results. Even at the international level, the mitigation measures seem to be fragmented. Even though organizations across many sectors have mandates and uh, expertise that can contribute to a useful set of IED mitigation measures, there lacks a single IED forum which is essential to invest in coordination and information exchange. Therefore, we can say that the focus should be placed on the capacity of governments to effectively bring together several policy strands for comprehensive national action ranging from commercial mining, inner city development, violent extremism and military stockpile management to agriculture and aviation security, a holistic approach of the government is essential for making progress in dealing with the threats which are faced because of the improvised explosive devices. So with this information, have a look at this question. Consider the following statements about improvised explosive device. The first statement reads, it is a homemade bomb that is frequently employed by guerrillas, insurgents and other non-state actors as an effective weapon against a conventional military force. Yes, this statement is correct. The second statement reads, the two basic categories of IEDs are command initiated and autonomously initiated. Yes, this statement is also correct. So we have to identify the correct statement or statements from these given statements. Since both the statements are correct, the correct answer for this question is option C, both 1 and 2. Now have a look at this fourth question. It is based on this news article which talks about the celebrations at a village of Telangana which happens whenever a girl child is born. And the happiness is attributed to the Sukanya Samridhi Yojana which is a savings scheme being implemented by the union government under which all the girl childs will be given a savings account. See the scheme was launched by our PM as a measure to the alarming disparity in the sex ratio. It is a small deposit scheme meant to meet the education and marriage expenses of a girl child. And under this scheme, an account can be opened in a post office or branches authorized by the banks in the name of a girl child by submitting the birth certificate. And the account can be opened till the girl child attains 10 years of age. And note that only one account can be opened in the name of a girl child and the account can be transferred anywhere in India from one post office or bank to another. The account can be opened with a minimum of 250 rupees and thereon any amount in multiple of 100 rupees can be deposited. 
Note that a minimum of 250 rupees and a maximum of 150,000 rupees can be deposited in a financial year. The interest for the amount will be on the basis of the government notification of that period and it will be calculated on a yearly compounded basis and will be credited to the account. Also know that one premature withdrawal of up to 50% is allowed when the girl child attains 18 years of age and this is allowed to meet the educational expenses of the child and the account will mature on the completion of 21 years from the date of opening of the account or on the marriage of the account holder whichever is earlier. So this is all about Sukanya Samriddhi Yojana. Now with this information have a look at this question. Consider the following schemes. We have three schemes given here. Bethi Bachao Bethi Badao, Pradhan Mantri Sukanya Samriddhi Yojana and CBSE Udan Scheme. Which of the above schemes are entitled exclusively for girl child? Here the correct answer for this question is option D, 1, 2 and 3 because all the three schemes are exclusively for girl children. So with this we have analyzed almost all the relevant news articles from today's The Hindu Newspaper. Now let us move on to the practice questions discussion section based on today's analysis. See today we have three mains practice questions. Please write your answers and post it in the comment section. Our feedback will be given in a reasonable time frame. So friends, with this we have come to the end of analysis of all the news articles taken up for today's discussion and also the discussion of practice questions. If you like this video, please press the like button, comment, share and do subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel for more updates related to civil service preparation. Thank you.